see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? In our recognition that Jesus is God, we remind ourselves that Jesus was also a real physical person who lived on this earth and died a cruel death on a cross. Meditating on the wounds of Jesus reminds us of this and is an ancient custom in the Christian church. In our meditation this Good Friday, we think of the different wounds of Jesus and what they might mean for us personally, especially as we emerge from a long period of time which for many of us has had more than its share of pain and wounds and loss. Today we stay with Christ crucified, not rushing on ahead to our triumphal Easter celebration of death defeated and the empty cross. We pause to stay in the hard encounter with the wounded God. His hands. How did Jesus use his hands? He used them to work in the carpenter's shop, hard manual labour. They were used to serve, to wash the disciples' feet, to bless. He blessed the loaves and fish. It was with his hands that Jesus wrote in the dust as the woman who was accused of adultery was brought to him. He laid hands on a person or touched a person in order to heal them. The last act of the free hands of Jesus was to heal the ear of the high priest's slave, which had been cut off by Simon Peter. These were the hands that were bound when Jesus was arrested, that Jesus used to hold the cross that he had to carry, the hands that were nailed to the cross, his arms outstretched wide. Thomas was later to see for himself the wounds in Jesus' hands where they had been pierced by the nails. Let us ponder for a moment those outstretched arms held in place on the cross by nails hammered through his hands. Outstretched arms can be a sign of welcome. Jesus stretched out his arms to welcome little children. And he said, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Outstretched arms can be a gesture of blessing and healing. They can be thought of as being uplifted in prayer. Jesus ever lives to intercede for us. Think on those times when your life has been touched by the hand of God and thank God for them. Perhaps it was at times of answered prayer, encouragement, healing, forgiveness, or some moment when you were touched by his grace and mercy. Think of your hands. What good things have they received? Perhaps at communion, when we remember the death of Jesus, we stretch out our hands to receive the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Lord Jesus, as you hold up your hands to us, we see the scars left by the nails. We place ourselves in your hands, the hands that healed and comforted and washed weary feet. May we, your followers and disciples, use our hands to create comfort and to heal. His feet. Jesus' feet took him to many different places where the power of God was needed. With his feet he climbed mountains, walked on water, crossed the fields. They would have been roughened by much walking. His feet were made wet by the tears of the woman who then dried them with her hair kissed them and poured expensive perfume on them. His feet took him to Jerusalem, when he knew that his destiny was that there was to suffer and to die. 
His feet took him up the hill to Calvary. These were the feet that were pierced by the nails on the cross at Calvary. How might the feet of Jesus influence our lives? Perhaps two ways. First, we are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. In the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, Peter writes, It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example, so that you would follow in his steps. We are to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Peter was writing his letter to slaves, people who lived with the tension of having the freedom of the gospel, but were disempowered by their social setting. We are called to do good, even when suffering unjustly. The second way that the feet of Jesus can influence our lives is pictured for us in the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. As Jesus did, so we should wash one another's feet. This means we are to serve one another in love and humility and in ways which are practical and perhaps as socially uninviting as Jesus washing the feet of those first disciples. Jesus, our brother, as we dare to follow in the steps you trod, be our companion on the way, and make us long to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. His back. Jesus turned his back on sin. He turned his back on Peter when Peter tried to tempt him to avoid the cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. The disciples would have seen a lot of Jesus' back as they followed him around Galilee. He strode ahead of the crowd up the mountain or into the boat so that he could teach them. The disciples would probably have watched the back of Jesus in Gethsemane, at least for as long as they could stay awake. In Gethsemane, Jesus was on the brink of abandoning the path of obedience to his Father. He prayed that he would not be brought to the time of trial, but then added, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Certainly the disciples turned their backs on Jesus. In his hour of need, they fell asleep. Jesus' back was subject to the cruel flogging, which was part of Jesus' physical suffering for us. Such flogging in the ancient world was a brutal affair, and some victims died from that alone. They flogged condemned prisoners before they were crucified in order to shorten the time that they were on the cross. Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Then Jesus carried the heavy cross on his back, raw wounds against rough wood. Imagine the pain. How might the back of Jesus influence our lives? Picture in your mind's eye the progress of Jesus along the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, struggling to carry his cross on his back. And here again his call to us to carry our cross. What does it mean for us to carry our cross? Someone once said, Jesus is not using cross-bearing to describe the human experience of carrying some huge burden through life. It is different. Cross-bearing as a follower of Jesus means nothing less than giving one's whole life over to him. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come with me, they must forget self, carry their cross and follow me. So the back of Jesus reminds us that we must turn our back on the things which may harm us in order that we can see what God is calling us to do for him in the world.
Sustain me in my quest, dearest Saviour, to follow you with my whole heart, that I may know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. His head. We do not know what Jesus looked like. We have pictures in our mind of what he might have looked like, influenced by paintings or sculptures of him. What we do know is that he was recognised by many people who flocked to see him and hear him speak. Perhaps we can picture him walking the hills and using his eyes to take in the natural landscape and human life, useful for his sermon material and parables. His eyes were attuned to detail. He even saw the widow put into the collection all that she had. His ears were also attuned to detail. He heard the, the tone of people's voices. He knew when to challenge, when to encourage. He listened and ministered to people's hearts and could get to the root of their problems. How was the head of Jesus wounded? Perhaps the first occasion was the kiss of Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. It has become a notorious kiss because what should have been a sign of affection and honour was given with the opposite intentions, a mark of identity for execution. The first wound to his head was not in itself physically painful, but it was personally destructive, violating a bond of trust. Then again, when the soldiers mocked him, when he was on the cross and they forced a crown of thorns on his head, King was crowned, but his kingship was seen not by a crown of diamonds, but by a crown of thorns. His kingship was seen in suffering and humiliation. Lord, we pray that you will enter into our lives and transform us by the renewal of our minds as well as our hearts. Help us to learn and relearn the way of following you, even though there may be a cost to bear. His side. Many people walked beside Jesus in his lifetime. Mary and Joseph would have held his hands and walked beside him as he himself was learning to walk. Other families accompanied him and his own family to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. He sat beside people in the synagogue and the marketplace. He began his ministry by calling the twelve disciples to be alongside him. They listened to him, watched him and learned from him. Later in his ministry, he included alongside him those whose family or social setting made them undesirable, outcasts, lepers, prostitutes. Many were by his side. He died on the cross with thieves either side of him on their crosses. The wound in the side of Jesus is mentioned only in John's Gospel. It was inflicted after he had died. Jewish law forbade leaving bodies exposed after dusk. Burial had to be on the same day. So a soldier pierced his side with a spear to prove that Jesus was dead. For his contemporaries, being alongside Jesus meant learning from him. We too are disciples or learners. Christ is both in us and beside us. How does our being alongside Jesus impact on us, on our lives? Lord, Help us to know we are continually being strengthened, being alongside you. And help us to know that we have eternal protection because, Jesus, you are alongside us. His heart. When we are spiritually tired or drained, we are aware of the need to come home. 
spiritual refreshment might come to us by taking a walk in the place that we have visited before. Another time, going to somewhere we have often visited before never fails to refresh or challenge us. We find this to be true in our spiritual lives too, perhaps reading a very familiar passage of scripture, a psalm or a parable. For me, Psalm 121 always inspires me. It is a natural resting place to which we often return. On another occasion, a fresh movement of God's Spirit within us, something totally new, inspires us and renews us too. As we consider the heart of Jesus today, it might offer the chance to come home. It is hard for us even to imagine what Jesus experienced at his crucifixion. Alongside the physical pain and suffering, he, he experienced emotional anguish and spiritual anguish. His close friends deserted him. He was betrayed by one of those closest to him. Another close friend denied him. His was a heartbreaking death. The heart of Jesus was easily moved. It was moved with compassion when he saw people in need. It was moved to tears. He wept when he saw the sin of people and the effects that it had. He wept when his friend Lazarus died. The heart of Jesus is one of love and self-giving. It is a heart that beats for you and me. The love of Jesus is for everyone. It is pure, unconditional love, offered freely to each person who will receive it. In accepting this love and responding to it, we can begin to understand the wounded heart of Jesus and allow ourselves to be given a new, woundable heart which can love and give as Jesus did. As he was preparing for death and as he was dying, the heart of Jesus was concerned for the well-being of his disciple and his mother. But the wounds of the heart of Jesus continue beyond his death, beyond his resurrection into eternity. His heart is continually wounded by our failure to live in love, by our failure to keep his laws. This Jesus whose heart we wound, nevertheless intercedes for us, and by the grace of God, our hearts can be changed by him. We pray this Good Friday that God will forever change our hearts, soften our hearts, enlarge our hearts. Is it possible for a man to speak to another's heart? For a man on a cross 2,000 years ago, upon a hill, to speak today to another's own heart? Is it possible for one man's death to be another's life? Is it possible for one man's shadow to throw light on life and love for everyone 2,000 years on? Our closing prayer. Most merciful God, by your Son you strengthened your Son so that he was able to suffer for us. Send your Spirit now so that we may be strengthened to look upon him whom we have pierced, to receive all the benefits of his passion and to offer ourselves wholly to your service for his dear name's sake. Amen. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. <laughs>